Hi everybody, let's continue our discussion on the brain. This is video C. My name is Dr. Kat Vlies and I'm from Central New Mexico Community College. So we discussed the cerebral cortex in quite a bit of detail last time, remember that? And we looked at the functional areas, the, sun, the, the, the primary functional uh, sensory areas, the primary motor areas, and then we also looked at some association areas and we uh, talked a little bit about that pretty complex multimodal association area called the prefrontal cortex. And then we wrapped up by looking at the white matter of the brain and um, pointed out that the white matter is made up of myelinated fibers that can run in different directions. They can either stay within a cerebral hemisphere or they can uh, interconnect the two cerebral hemispheres, such as the commissures or the, I'm sorry, the, the corpus callosum is an example of a commissure, such as the fornix is an example of a commissure that interconnects the left and the right side. And then we also have projection fibers, and that's what we will actually study a lot when we get to the spinal cord, when we look at fibers that interconnect the brain and the spinal cord. And a good example of tracts that I already introduced you to that contain fibers that are projection fibers are the pyramids. And we learned that the pyramids are examples of tracts that cross over uh, pretty superiorly, that is in the medulla oblongata of the brain, which is the most inferior portion of the brain. So not in the spinal cord, but in the brain still. Um, most tracts you're going to see actually cross over in the spinal cord. So keep that in mind. So that we're still not done with the cerebrum, so we still need to look at what we refer to as some of the nuclei in the cerebrum. And remember, when we use the term nucleus in the central nervous system, we're always referring to a clump of cell bodies primarily, right? Or a clump of gray matter made up of cell bodies. There might be, of course, some unmyelinated fibers in there as well, but we should not see uh, myelinated fibers in there. So anytime we talk about a nucleus or a patch of gray matter, which is often a nucleus, um, there's a lot of integration occurring, lots of synapses, lots of neurotransmitters being passed on, so lots, inf inf lots of information passed on, and therefore lots of integration, meaning in a sense decisions made. All right, so we have two kinds of um, what we refer to as subcortical nuclei. So they sit deep within the white matter, um, deeper to the cortex of the cerebrum. And we'll talk about the basal nuclei. And we'll first start with the, the amygdala and the hippocampus. And of course, there's pairs of these. So we make them plural as amygdalae and hippocampi. Um, so we'll get to those in just a second. I also want to mention that these nuclei are the primary location for acetylcholine production and in the brain to impact what the cortex does. So here we have nuclei deep within the white matter they're going to collect information from other parts of the brain, particularly cortical parts, and process that information and help make pretty serious decisions about what the body should do, all right? So you, let's use the image on this picture, and I just blew it up a little bit too much. Let me reduce that just a tiny bit so you can still see the writing. There you go. <clears throat> And then you see the two nuclei that we're going to start out with, which are the nuclei that we refer to as the hippocampus nuclei, and then the amygdaloid or the amygdala nuclei, you can call them. There are more nuclei illustrated on this diagram. They do not belong to the subcortical nuclei that we're studying. So these are the first two we'll look at, the amygdala and the hippocampus, and then we'll also add the basal nuclei on another diagram. This picture is really an illustration of all the various regions of the brain that form that emotional brain we began to discuss last time, called the limbic system. 
So the limbic system is a functional brain system that we'll look at in more detail um, after your exam, but we refer to it as the emotional brain. And so you'll hear me uh, refer to it at times, and there's many parts that make this up, as you can see on this colored diagram. So when you hear amygdala or hippocampus, right away you should remember that they're dealing with memory formation. Um, depending on which one it is, short-term versus long-term, actually both of them are pretty much involved in long-term um, memory formation and, and uh, the hippocampus, especially in converting short-term memory into long-term memory. So keep that in mind. These are very, very important for memory. And they're part of the limbic system, as I said. Now, the amygdala, you might hear about um, throughout your career as a health professional. I don't know if any of you might become interested in becoming a psych psychiatric nurse, uh, where you deal a lot with people who have mental issues or possibly uh, post-traumatic stress syndrome. So this is an area of the brain, the amygdala, that is where we see lots of changes or lots of uh, impacts um, when people suffer from anxiety, post-traumatic post stress syndrome. This is the part of your brain that you use when you're really scared, when you're really emotionally angry, um, when you're upset, things like that. So keep that in mind. Um, we see that alcoholics um, have uh, things that look different in their amygdala. Uh, so lots of things happening in that amygdala. And if you're really interested in this stuff, I suggest you read a little bit more about it. All right, I'm not going to go into more detail. Um, again, we can't cover that much detail on the brain, but I know some of you are probably interested in this, so just go online. Um, Wikipedia is a really great resource to read more about the brain, and it's written in a language that you all should be able to follow pretty well. The hippocamp, oh, Let's come back to the amygdala one more time. It gets its name, by the way, because the two nuclei are kind of almond-shaped, which is what amygdala stands for. While the hippocampus, that literally means hippo, horse, that literally means seahorse because of the shape of these two nuclei. Notice that the hippocampus seems to be one of the first structures to be damaged in people who suffer from Alzheimer's, so that's another interesting thing. And one thing that is not showing here on this slide is that this is where, this is the first location or one of the first locations where stem cells were found in the brain. Remember that you have to read a little uh, article about stem cells in the brain. If you look at your to-dos, don't forget to look at that. Uh, read about that a little bit, and we talked about um, the fact that neurons can't divide, but we do know that there are stem cells produced, um, or present, I should say, in the brain. So the hippocampus is a location where we know that there are stem cells. And then finally, your hippocampus we supposedly use for spatial navigation. I must have a very, very small hippocampus. So the next set of nuclei again, located deep within the white matter. We call the basal nuclei, but heads up, you guys, very often you'll still see these being referred to as the basal ganglia. And it's very possible that the next instructor you have or your lab instructor, I might even at times uh, refer to them as the basal ganglia. I'm going to try to ensure that on exams that we use the term nuclei, because remember, if we do use the term ganglion, it's a bit of a mistake, right? Because a ganglion is a, select, is a collection of cell bodies outside of the CNS. But this is an old term, and it's very difficult to get rid of old terminology and anatomy. People continue to use it through the years, and, and so we have to just sort of accept and this misnomer and put in the back of our minds, okay, we know better, right? I'll try to use the term nuclei. So again, let's take a look here at our frontal or coronal section of the brain. Once again, here you have the longitudinal fissure, right? 
and right here interconnecting your two sides of the hemisphere, cerebral hemispheres, you have that corpus callosum. All right, we've learned about that already. Um, down here we see a little bit of the amygdala, but we're now going to focus on the basal nuclei. So all the ones in the turquoise color belong to the basal nuclei, not this dark gray color. Deep within the brain, we have chambers that are filled with cerebrospinal fluid, and we refer to those chambers as ventricles. So ventricles are chambers deep within the brain that contain cerebrospinal fluid, and these gray things are these lateral, or some of these ventricles. We have four of them, and we'll learn more about those later. So they are not part of the basal nuclei. So we have three different kinds of basal nuclei in each hemisphere. So if we point them out, we have in the darker turquoise, we have the caudate nucleus. And it gets that name because if we were to look at a sagittal view of the brain, a mid-sagittal section, meaning, you know, I were to slice my head right through the middle like so to where we have two exact halves, then we could see that the caudate nucleus is kind of, a, the, kind of ends in a tail shape. From there, it's named cauda, referring to tail. Then we have the rather large putamen, and then we have the globus pallidus. And I always forget what putamen means. Every semester I forget to look up what it means. Maybe, some of, maybe somebody can look it up for me. The globus pallidus literally means the pale globe. So it, it has a paler look to it. All of these are nuclei. So all of them are going to be made of um, lots and lots of cell bodies. And all of them are therefore going to be showing up as gray matter. Right? So these are little patches, islands of gray matter deep within the white matter. So wherever I'm pointing now, that's all white matter. Even some white matter in between here. As a matter of fact, last time when you learned about the projection fiber fibers, I briefly mentioned some projection fibers collectively form something called the internal capsule. And that internal capsule runs through or in between um, these nuclei here and even through some of them, which is why we have um, a term called the corpus striatum. And what is the corpus striatum? It literally means the striped body. And it includes the caudate nucleus as well as the putamen. And so why do we collectively refer to those two as the striped body? because of that internal capsule, all those fibers that run through there. So these nuclei, when we look at them on a slice of the brain, look very striped, all right? So all of these fibers run in between and even through some of these nuclei. So I pointed out the corpus striatum and I explained what it means or why it gets that name. And then we have two other nuclei that we refer to as the lentiform or lenticular nuclei. And that includes, again, the putamen, but this time the globus pallidus. So these two together. And why do they get that name, lentiform? Because they collectively look like a lens. And again, you can't tell from this particular cut of the brain but if you were to look at more of a sagittal cut, they looked more like a lens, like the lens of, a, of a, an eyeball, for instance. Now, these basal nuclei, they sit so deep within that white matter that it's well not, they're not well understood because it's literally physically very difficult to study them. They're just sitting way, way deep in that brain. We do know that these basal nuclei collect all kinds of information, particularly from the cortical area. So I give you an example there. Um, 
the basal nuclei might be collecting information from the primary motor cortex and then the association that sits right next to it called the premotor association area, which is that area where you, that lights up when you're rehearsing something in your head before you have to go out on the floor and perform, let's say, right? Or you, it's that part of your brain that you use to play repetitive things like piano or typing, things like that. Um, so it, the basal nuclei can pull information from these different areas and then make some decisions about how your body needs to continue. So in other words, um, by collecting all of that information, your body, with the help of these basal nuclei, is not going to make the wrong movements. And, and I'm not sure if I can give you the best example right now, but many of you are taking notes right now, right? It wouldn't be a good move for you to now suddenly get up in the midst of writing. That's kind of an extreme example. But by collecting this information, these basal nuclei ensure that your body is not going to start using those muscles to make you, uh, to create a movement that would not allow you to take notes anymore. That would not be a very efficient way of functioning, would it be now, all right? Um, so we'll also see that your basal nuclei, and I'll make a note of this for you, have many functions to, that are similar to the cerebellum. Functions. So I didn't put that here in my writing, but the functions are very similar to the cerebellum. Your cerebellum, too, collects all kinds of information from different parts of the brain to make sure that however we then move our body is going to be efficient and effective. So your basal nuclei, as well as your cerebellum, are very important in controlling voluntary movements of your muscles. And which muscles are they there for? Your skeletal muscles, right? Not your heart, not your smooth muscle, but your skeletal muscles. Good. We also see that the basal nuclei seem to play a role in regulating attention and cognition as well. So they interact with all parts of the brain, and I reiterate that in this particular bullet. So let's do a review of the structures, or some of the structures that we've studied so far, with the help of this frontal or coronal cut of the brain. So here we see our two cerebral hemispheres, and we see very nicely here the longitudinal fissure separating those two cerebral hemispheres. Here we have the cerebral cortex with its many sulci. And we also have, of course, our gyri. Lots of white matter made up of myelinated fibers. And deep within the white matter, we have our basal nuclei. Before I get to the basal nuclei, let's come back to the white matter. Here we have an important portion of the white matter uh, referred to as the corpus callosum, and the corpus callosum is a, an example of a commissure. If we now take a look at the basal nuclei, we can right here see our first basal nucleus hugging one of our ventricles. So these dark structures here are ventricles. Here's another one. So hugging these so-called lateral ventricles, we have the caudate nucleus. If we go more laterally, we then see the putamen, another nucleus, followed by the two parts of the globus pallidus. Notice that the globus pallidus is indeed colored a little lighter. Also, in between these nuclei, we see what is called an internal capsule, which is made up of lots and lots of fibers. And we also see that many fibers are present and creating this striated look in both the caudate nucleus and the putamen. So the caudate nucleus and the putamen together are often referred to as the corpus striatum, as we saw on a previous slide. On the other hand, the, the, the two nuclei I'm pointing out now, which are again your putamen and the globus pallidus, they collectively are often referred to as the lenticular or lentiform nucleus, or 
having the shape of a lens. If we go further back to the nuclei that we learned about, we learned about the subcortical nuclei, including the amygdaloid nuclei and the hippocampus. We can very nicely, right about here, see the almond-shaped -shape, um, nuclei called the amygdalae or the amygdaloid nuclei. We don't have the best view here of the hippocampus, so I won't be pointing that out. Brings us to the diencephalon. So we're finally done, finally, with the cerebrum. That took us a long time, didn't it? It took us ooh, the first lecture, last lecture, and part of this lecture. So you understand now how important a part that is. The, the cerebrum, of course, is also the biggest part, right? It's that big mushroom cap and consists of two hemispheres called the cerebral hemispheres. Now, the rest of the brain is also bilaterally symmetrical. You're used to hearing the terms cerebral hemispheres, but um, I know all of you have heard of the hypothalamus, which is what we're about to discuss here. It also has two hemispheres. Um, really, we should be talking about the hypothalami. Uh, we don't easily do that, but there are two parts to it. There are two parts to the thalamus. There are two, two halves to everything in, in the brain, pretty much. So keep that in mind. All right, so the diencephalon, the word diencephalon, literally means through the brain. And you'll see here on pictures why that should make sense, because it's a structure that is deep within the center of the brain, and all sensory information has to pass through one part of the diencephalon called the thalamus. Every sensory input must pass through it with one exception, and that is smell. And what is a fancier way of referring to smell? Olfaction. Very good. Even a lot of the motor output passes through that thalamus of the diencephalon. Okay. And you'll see I make reference to ventricles again. You know, when you learn about the ventricles for the second part of the brain, you probably need to come back to some of these earlier slides so that you better understand where these ventricles are located. So we have a total of four ventricles, and here we see mention of the third ventricle. So remember last time, or the time before too, I kept saying each major part of your brain is made up of three smaller parts, right? So quick review, cerebrum is made up of the cerebral cortex, the white matter, and the nuclei, the subcortical nuclei. While in the case of the diencephalon, we're going to see the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and then the epithalamus. You see these listed here. Notice that it says thalamus. Try to not confuse this with another structure which has nothing to do with the brain called thymus. All right? The thymus is a gland that covers your, your heart primarily, especially if you're a little kid. And then as we grow older, the thymus begins to uh, atrophy. But the thymus plays an important role in the immune system nothing to do with the brain, so keep them straight in your head. So after the diencephalon, we'll learn about the brain stem, and hopefully we will make it to the cerebellum. If not, you guys will have to prepare for that on your own because your third exam has been written and submitted and all that good stuff, so keep that in mind. So here we can see a nice image of the brain again. Here in the blue is the cerebrum, right? This is your corpus callosum, still part of the cerebrum. Here is the fornix. We learn about this area in between the fornix and the, commission, and the corpus callosum later. Here is that cerebellum. So and where is anterior? Where is the anterior side of the brain? The anterior side is over here, right? Because the posterior side is always where that, what is? cerebellum. Or you can also take a look at the brain stem, which we see here with that big bulge, mm -hmm. which we call the pons. We'll get to that. That should always point anteriorly. That helps too. 
So deep, deep within the brain, then we get to the bright green area, and that's the diencephalon. And very often you can find it easily because you see this dot here, right? So the three parts of the diencephalon are as follows. We have the two egg-shaped parts of the thalamus, so they're kind of egg-shaped, like so. I probably pointed that out a little bit too big, but notice where that dot is. That indicates where the thalamus is. So it's, it's think of two tiny little bird eggs pushed together. <coughs> then we have um, inferior and anterior to the thalamus, the hypothalamus. If you listen to the word, it tells you it sits below the thalamus. And then very posterior and even hugging the thalamus, we have the epithalamus. So this por portion plus hugging the thalamus that is re referred to as the epithalamus. Dangling off the hypothalamus, right here, we have our famous gland called the pituitary gland. And just anterior to the pituitary, we see an area where the optic tracts, that is, those two nerves that leave your eyes and enter the brain and then are called optic tracts, where they cross over. So your optic nerves become optic tracts. They cross over right here before the fibers make it all the way to what part of the brain? The occipital lobe. Remember, that's where visual interpretation occurs, in the occipital lobe. So let's focus on the, the thalamus and its anatomy. You see a picture here with lots and lots of information. By no means do I expect you to memorize the names of all these various parts of the, the thalamus, except for a couple of what one major thing we'll get to in just a moment. But notice that the thalamus is made up of many, many different nuclei. I purposely left the legend to just show you how much gray matter is in that thalamus. What does that tell you again? lots and lots of synapses, lots and lots of communication between cells, between neurons, lots and lots of neurotransmitters passed on. So lots and lots and lots of um, integration occurring. So remember I tried to explain to you that um, there, the thalamus is visualized as two miniature soft boiled eggs of a, of a tiny little bird pushed together. And these two hemispheres, and this answers your question, Lorena, are interconnected. And where they are interconnected, we have that dot that you just saw. So if I, you know, I'm using my two fists, put them together, and you need to imagine now that in between my two fists are, uh, is a little interconnection. And that's that dot, you know, if you, if I were to slice through my two fists that are put together, I would see it as a dot, that interconnection. That is called the intermediate mass or the interthalamic adhesion. Your book made a big boo-boo. It should say interthalamic, not intra, because there's a big difference between the prefix inter and intra. Remember, inter means in between. So the thalamus is the biggest part of the diencephalon. So what does it do? Well, I've already mentioned that all sensory information, every piece of sensory information except for smell must pass through the thalamus. So all the other special senses, also your simple senses such as the, re the, the detection of touch and temperature changes and pain Every one of those has to go through the thalamus. So that explains why you see so many nuclei in the thalamus. And so what does it do? And by the way, when we learn about the spinal tracts, the spinal cord tracts, we will trace axons or neurons with our axons passing through the thalamus, synapsing, and then going to other parts of the brain. So what is the importance of the thalamus? Well, I tend to give you little keywords from now on, especially when you're learning about these different parts. And I have uh, bold-faced or bold-printed them here. So you can call it the thalamus a switchboard, a gateway, an editor. I often think of it as an editor. 
Remember, all sensory information goes through the thalamus, and a lot of the motor output goes through it as well. But when we focus, let's say, on especially sensory information, think of what an editor typically does. Let's think of the editor of a magazine or a website or a newspaper. What does an editor do? An editor cuts out paragraphs, right? replaces it with new information, rearranges things, but especially throws out any information that is irrelevant, redundant, not important, um, may, again, reorganizes it to where it makes more sense, it flows better. That's kind of what your thalamus does. So it collects all of this information that keeps passing through it, and it tosses a bunch of information that is absolutely not necessary to arrive in the brain or to even leave the brain. But if we're focusing on sensory information, uh, of course, what needs to arrive in the brain. Your thalamus is yet another structure that is part of that emotional brain we call the limbic system. And I don't know if you've begun to pick up on this, but many of these structures that I've been pointing out and saying, hey, this is also part of the limbic system, which is your emotional brain. Have you noticed that many of them are associated with memory and learning? Ever noticed that emotional experiences really help you remember something really well? Whether they're really wonderful emotional experiences or not so wonderful, unfortunately. You know, for, or, um, and even olfaction, your smell is very much associated with memory as well. So let's take a look at the hypothalamus. Well, actually, let's take a look at this picture first. So I'm going to ask you, what kind of a cut of the brain is this? This is mid-sagittal, right? And this is where we very nicely see the corpus callosum with the fornix, and then deep to that, so once you know where that fornix is, that literally hugs that thalamus right here, more or less, with that intermediate mass. See that dot again? That's that intermediate mass. So you can really easily locate the thalamus. And then if you just go a bit anterior and inferior to the thalamus and try to create a bit of a triangular-shaped structure, that is your hypothalamus. So right here is your hypothalamus. Let me use a different color so you see it better right here. And if you're lucky, your picture will always show that pituitary dangling off the hypothalamus. So the pituitary is connected to the hypothalamus with a little stem, and we refer to that stem as the infundibulum or stalk, right? So there is a direct connection there between the pituitary and the hypothalamus, and you'll learn more in AMP2 how the hypothalamus tells the pituitary what to do in AMP2. I don't know how well you see this. I'm going to blow this up a little bit, or a lot. There we go. We're zooming in onto that, or into that hypothalamus. But Right here, you should see a little bit of a bump. You see that right there? This is a, a, a nucleus that sits right here in the hypothalamus. And of course, there's two of them. Everything is bilaterally symmetrical. And since it so clearly sticks out, we typically have you guys study these nuclei. They're referred to as the mammillary bodies. The mammillary bodies. And... You see that spelled for you right there. And they play a very important role in olfaction, again, in smell. So here we're taking a look at the brain, um, sort of more of an inferior view. So let's blow this up. And now that I have enlarged this, these little structures here that look like little nipples, those are your mammillary bodies, because mammillary refers to little breasts, little nipples, right? And they really um, show up pretty well. 
on the brain when you study it. This is that bumpy portion of the brain stem that indicates the anterior side of the brain. So functions of the hypothalamus. Your hypothalamus is a very important structure when it comes to all these viscera that you cannot consciously control, right? You, you can consciously control your skeletal muscles, but your viscera, that is all these organs distributed throughout your thorax and your abdominal pelvic cavity that, um, are, that contain smooth muscle, for instance, or they contain heart muscle, as is the case for your heart, and other, other uh, and, or they might function as glands, your hypothalamus is the big supervisor of the fibers that innervate those structures in your thoracic and your abdominal pelvic areas. And the fibers that the hypothalamus supervises belong to your autonomic nervous system. And so very often you'll hear me refer to the hypothalamus as the big boss of the autonomic nervous system. We haven't talked a whole lot about the autonomic nervous system, but we have at times mentioned the sympathetic nervous system, right? That's your fight or flight nervous system, your system that kicks in when your body is stressed, whether it's because you have to fight for your life or, or defend yourself or you are working out really hard, let's say, or you need to run uh, down the hallway really fast to get to class on time. We'll get to the autonomic nervous system in a couple of weeks. But so your hypothalamus really supervises that autonomic nervous system. And I just listed for you what particular effectors it, it, um, these fibers of the autonomic nervous system innervate. Smooth muscle uh, is innervated by autonomic nervous system. So is the, the heart is innervated by the, by the autonomic nervous system. So are your glands. Uh, often and so consequently you can imagine that it's those structures that are going to be impacted to so your heart rate your blood pressure um, whether um, how fast you breathe um, your your glucose levels your your all kinds of things like that in addition to that your hypothalamus has lots of nuclei in it once again and they have lots of different functions um, for instance, you're also going to see that this is where we have our thirst center. So when you're thirsty, your hypothalamus is literally telling your body to drink. Um, this is also where you have your sex drive in your hypothalamus. And once again, part of your limbic system, that emotional brain, therefore also telling you that it probably has a bit of a role in learning and memory. But your hypothalamus being part of that emotional uh, brain called the limbic system helps out the amygdala, which it sits very close to, with dealing with pleasure feelings, anxiety feelings, scared feelings, mad, you know, being very angry feelings, things like that. The fact that I just told you that your thirst center is located in the hypothalamus should maybe hopefully help you remember that your hypothalamus is one of the structures in your body or in your brain that regulates your diurnal rhythm, your sleep-wake cycle, your, the time, you know, this is the time to eat, this is the time to drink. You know, I've mentioned, uh, maybe I haven't, but, you know, in a few weeks I'll go back to see my family in, in Belgium when we're on break, and it's always a disaster because they forget to feed me, and, of course, I'm on this totally different clock and I'm starving in the middle of the night, or I'm starving, you know, when they've just finished eating, and I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so hungry, where's the food? Um, so, yeah, my whole biological rhythm is totally messed up when I go to Europe. But anyway, and as I mentioned, your hypothalamus has that connection with the pituitary, so it's going to also regulate the release of hormones by the pituitary. You have learned... Uh, um, at least about a hormone the semester called oxytocin. That's one of the pituitary hormones. But your pituitary produces all kinds of hormones. ADH, just for your information, stands for antidiuretic 
hormone. So what does that mean? It keeps you from peeing. That's a good way of saying that. Very good. Diuresis means to make urine. Good. The last part of your diencephalon is called the epithalamus. So you have three parts. What were they again? Thalamus, biggest part. Hypothalamus, now epithalamus. So the epithalamus consists of a portion that sits posterior to the thalamus. So here's our thalamus. See the dot there? Here's your dot. There's your thalamus. And it says third ventricle on top of it, but that's because the third ventricle runs right in between the two hemispheres of the thalamus. So on the posterior aspect of the thalamus, that is part of the epithalamus. And then you see this reddish structure hugging the thalamus in between the fornix and the thalamus is this reddish structure. So what are all these things? Well, one part on the of the epithalamus that you need to know about right here is yet another gland called the pineal gland. Some people say pineal, uh, some people say pineal body. So this is another gland in your brain together with the pituitary. And what this gland produces is a hormone called melatonin. Now, I know you've heard of that because you can just go buy this at Walgreens or Albertsons. Of course, it's not, it, we don't ever know how much is in the capsules, but melatonin is, again, a hormone that helps regulate your sleep-wake cycle. So your epithalamus is also involved in your diurnal cycle, just like your hypothalamus. So melatonin is a hormone that starts to increase in your body when you're getting closer to bedtime, to your regular bedtime. That's what makes you sleepy. That's why people sometimes supplement with melatonin. They hope that they will be able to fall asleep better. Um, and as you get closer to your regular wake-up time, your melatonin levels start to drop. And sometimes people supplement with melatonin when they travel across major time zones, like, you know, I have to go to Europe, probably would be a good idea to take melatonin. I always forget, and I, I don't really know if it r really works that well. Some people really believe in it. But once again, when you go purchase these things over the counter, you never know how much is in it, in the capsules that you take, so it's not very regulated. All right, so the, the pineal gland is part of the epithalamus, and so what is this red thing here? Well, in the brain, in particular locations, we have another little red spot here, for instance, we have these capillary beds, and we were going to call these capillary beds a choroid plexus, so that is a capillary bed. And why is it worth, worth mentioning these capillary beds? Well, their plasma is going to be filtered and become CSF. And where does that CSF enter into then? Into the ventricles. Right? Your ventricles are the ones that contain that cerebrospinal fluid. So we're going to see after your exam how that works. But for now, I just wanted you to be able to make a connection between choroid plexus and um, what it does. We have different locations for the choroid plexus, um, but for when it comes to the epithalamus, this cord plexus that nicely hugs the thalamus plus the pineal gland, and then there's another structure I'm not holding you responsible for, but this posterior region of the thalamus plus the cord plexus we call the epithalamus. Oh yeah, another thing to mention about the pineal gland, I already said it secretes melatonin, also very much in regulating your mood, by the way, but um, we sometimes refer to the pineal gland as the third eye because it's very responsive to light stimulation, which again explains why it's involved in the sleep-wake cycle. But, um, for instance, we've learned that people who live in northern climates, like where I'm from, um, in Belgium, which is, you know, at the level of Labrador, Canada, it's pretty far north, 
um, people who are not exposed to enough natural sunlight tend to suffer more from depression. They, they, they suffer from something called seasonal affective disorder, and it has to do with them not being stimulated by light enough. So people who do a lot of graveyard shifts have to be very careful and make sure that they get enough light. You know, it's important for you guys when you have kids to send them outside, make sure they get enough natural light. You know, we tend to be a very indoor society these days, but we have to be careful with that. To, let's move on to the brain stem, which is our third major part of the brain. And just like the, all the other ones, it is made of three major parts. So we have in the brain stem, well, let's first point out where it's located. So the brain stem sits inferior to the diencephalon. How can you find the diencephalon? You look for the dot right there. And then you approximately can delineate the diencephalon right here. So we have here the beginning of the brain stem, a small area of the brain called the midbrain. And then we have the rest of the brain stem with that bulging part calling the pons. And then we have finally the medulla oblongata. Okay, so those are three parts of the brain stem. And because of where it's located and because it's connected to the spinal cord, like so, so your medulla oblongata is directly connected to the spinal cord. Think of the brain stem as kind of the tail uh, the beginning of the tail of the brain that then creates the big tail, which is the spinal cord eventually. So information that needs to enter or leave the brain is always going to have to do it through the brain stem somehow, right? So we say that the brain stem pr provides a pathway for tracts between higher and lower brain centers. The highest brain centers that we have are located in the cerebral cortex. Now, eventually, we'll also learn a little bit about the peripheral nervous system, right? We're focusing here on the central nervous system, which means we'll talk nerves. And arising from the brain, we have a total of 12 pairs of nerves. So we have 12 pairs of cranial nerves total. But of those 12 pairs we see that 10 are actually associated with the brain stem. So lots of information leaving and entering the brain stem. So the brain stem is interesting because it is supervised by the hypothalamus. In other words, the brain stem is sort of the starting point for um, a good portion of your autonomic nervous system. And so whatever the hypothalamus dictates, this brainstem basically has to follow up with. We also cannot function or survive without the brainstem. You know, if you think about your viscera, if your heart doesn't work, if your lungs don't, don't work, you're already in pretty bad shape. Right, so you can't really survive very well. And you know, I, I've added some information here. This is especially older research, but in, in research in the past, if an animal's brain was dealt with such that the brain stem was kept, but most everything was removed, that organism could still survive. It didn't function as greatly, but the very automatic behaviors kept going on, such as, I don't know, I listed some there. They could still walk and run. They could still copulate and groom. These are very basic survival um, skills. I shouldn't call them skills, but, but um, actions that animals have built into their brain stem and they do not really need the cerebral cortex for these actions to be carried out. Um, they cannot consciously decide to go through these actions of swallowing or copulating or walking or running around, um, but they, the, the fibers are still there to allow these actions or behaviors to happen. So if we look at our sagittal view again of the brain, then right here we have our brain stem, right? 
You can very nicely see the cerebellum here. So the cerebellum sits posterior to the brain stem. The most superior portion of the brain stem is the midbrain right here. So I'm going to fill that in, in with blue so you have a better idea of where it's located. It's a pretty small section, but let me stop here for a moment before we move on. When we learned about the embryological development of the brain, remember I had you memorize the three primary brain vesicles, the, the forebrain or the prosencephalon, the midbrain, the midbrain or the mesencephalon, and then the hindbrain or the rhombencephalon. And I also reminded you that once we're done studying the parts of the brain, you need to go back to those primary brain vesicles to learn which vesicle gives rise to which parts of the brain. Well, what are the three primary brain vesicles again in English? You need to know them in Latin too. Forebrain, midbrain, hindbrain. The forebrain gives rise to your whole cerebral hemispheres and the diencephalon. We just finished studying those, right? That's all of the forebrain. So the forebrain of the embryo gives rise to both of those. And then now we're looking at the, the midbrain, which is the most superior part of the brain stem. Well, the embryological primary brain vesicle, which we call the midbrain, guess what it gives rise to? The midbrain, pretty simple. And everything else? Is, arises from your um, hindbrain, right? So the other parts of the brainstem and the cerebellum arise from the hindbrain, the rhombencephalon. Okay. So despite the fact that that midbrain is pretty tiny, it has some important structures that we need to learn about. And actually, I need to also fill in this portion right here. I neglected to color in that posterior portion because that's where we find these little structures that we refer to as the corpora quadrigemini. I'll point those out better, but right here on the posterior aspect of that midbrain is where we find the corpora quadrigemini. On the anterior side, on the other hand, right here more, that is where we find the cerebral peduncles. I'll get to these in more detail on the next slide. One thing I want you to be aware of is that that cerebellum actually has physical connections with each part of the brain stem. So the physical connection between the cerebellum and the midbrain is referred to as the superior cerebellar peduncles. And the word peduncles, think of the word pedestrian, has feet in it. So it literally means little feet. I don't know why they use that term but they're basically a bunch of fibers that interconnect the cerebellum with the midbrain. So those are called superior cerebellar peduncles. Well, when we get to the pons, they will be called middle cerebellar peduncles. And guess what the ones are called that connect the cerebellum with the medulla? Inferior cerebellar peduncles, very good. Where are they exactly? You can't see them yet. I'll show them better on the next few slides. I'm just pointing them out already. This is not a great slide for you to see exactly what they look like, but I will. So here we're looking at a slide of, or an image of the midbrain plus some other structures. And, and this is an anterior view of the midbrain, which is, and we're focusing primarily on something called the cerebral peduncles. But let's get ourselves oriented. So here we see the pons, that's always easy to find followed by the brain stem. Again, this is an anterior view, right? The pons is what points anteriorly. That's that bulging part. And we see some areas here of the, um, the cerebrum with the, the thalamic um, hemispheres deep inside. So let's focus now on the midbrain. And this right here, all of this reddish stuff here is the anterior side of the midbrain and they continue or some of these fibers continue. It's very striped in here because of all of these projection fibers in here. And so we refer to this area here of the midbrain, which is on the anterior side, as our cerebral peduncles, literally meaning little feet that hold up the two cerebral hemispheres. 
So if I use my own body, let's say I'm putting my two elbows together and I now form cups with my two hands to where my two wrists are kind of almost touching one another. I'm kind of making a V with my forearms. Then my two hands that are shaping a cup represent the cerebral hemispheres. And these two forearms are basically these cerebral peduncles. They're all these fibers right here that hold up your cerebral hemispheres. So from there, their name. So since they're full of fibers, particularly a lot of the pyramids are located in this area, um, clearly this, this is a part where there's a lot of action potentials propagating very fast, right? And these pyramids are motor tracts, which tells you that they are carrying information down the brainstem into the spinal cord. Right? Motor always referring to leaving the CNS. Now we're looking at the posterior side of the midbrain. So this is still the midbrain. Don't lose track of where we are. This time we're on the posterior side. So we're looking at it from the back. And once again, these are portions of the cerebral hemispheres. Not everything, but portions with deep within the thalamus, etc. And right away, you see four little bumps sticking out here on the posterior side. Those are four little bodies, and that's why we call them the corpora quadri gemini, which literally means many bodies. Corpus means one body. Corpora means more than one body, many bodies. Quadro, you know what that means, four. And what does gemini mean? Twins, very good. So we have two sets of twins that makes a total of four little bodies, right? So the more superior ones get their unique name. We call them the two superior colliculi. And the, the two inferior ones, which are slightly bigger, are the two inferior colliculi. So the two pairs of colliculi together are referred to as the corpora quadrigemini. So lots of integration occurring in these colliculi. The superior colliculi contain what we call visual reflex centers, meaning that what, what this particular part of the brain does is as follows. Imagine that somebody were to drop something really heavy in the hallway. What would all of us do? We would look, right? That was our, would be our reflex. We would in, we would look, we would move our whole body possibly. Some of you would turn yourself completely on your chairs and look. And that's what is happening. This is what is processed in this particular part of your brain in the superior colliculi. So they, they, um, they receive all of this auditory information and then they'll respond with a, a somatic response. You're moving your body and also a visual response. Your inferior colliculi are more of a relay center for hearing. And remember that all information must always pass through the thalamus first um, to before it can make it to the cerebral cortex. So information about hearing will go through these guys, I'm sorry, the inferior colliculi, the thalamus, and then eventually make it to the temporal lobe of the cerebral cortex. Don't forget where hearing is interpreted in the cerebral cortex. So a couple more terms that are often used by anatomists. I don't use them as much uh, when it comes to the midbrain, and that is the term tectum and tegmentum. And they're very easily confused, so you're going to have to come up with a way to memorize which one is which. So the tectum is more of the, literally means the roof, and it's the more superior and anterior part of the midbrain. Let's think of it that way, more superior and anterior, especially anterior. So it includes your corpora quadrigemini, those, um, I'm sorry, I'm, back, I'm, I'm mistaken. Let's backtrack. This is, I should say, um, more posterior. Is that right? Yes, posterior, I'm sorry. <laughs> 
your um, corpora quadrigemini sit posterior. My mistake. While the tegmentum we refer to as, or the floor of your midbrain is often referred to as the tegmentum. And that's where we see a lot of um, gray matter that continues with the rest of the brain stem. It, when we go on to the, the pons and the medulla oblongata, I, I can hopefully point this out a little bit better rather than just look at this text slide. Here we're looking at a transverse section of the brain stem, so a section that looks like this, right? A transverse section that's as if I put a saw through my throat, if I pretended that my throat is the brain stem. You see what I'm trying to say? So that's a transverse section. Now the superior colliculi sit over here. They form that tectum, or most of that tectum, and where do they sit? Posterior, right? Oh, it says it right there. Good. And um, the tegmentum, I've pointed out here, is more, sits a little bit more uh, towards the anterior side of our brain stem. We're going to learn what the cerebral, cerebral aqueduct is, but basically I'm going to tell you right off the bat right now, it again contains cerebral spinal fluid. So what do you think it has to do with? Those ventricles. It actually interconnects the ventricles. Within the midbrain area, we have a very important nucleus, and that is called the substantia nigra, literally meaning black substance. And it's given that name because it actually looks very black. You can see it right here, colored black. And it looks so black because it's rich in melanin. Yes, the pigment that we see in the skin. That's what makes that area very dark. Melanin is basically a precursor for an important neurotransmitter called dopamine. All right, so why do we bring this up? Well, this part of the midbrain is what starts to deteriorate in people who suffer from Parkinson's disease. Now, Parkinson's disease is close to my heart because my father has advanced Parkinson's disease to where he's wheelchair bound and all the other major side effects. It's pretty sad. And so what causes Parkinson's disease? Well, for one, the problem stems from this particular area, the substantia nigra. In the substantia nigra, the neurons begin to die. And when they begin to die, there is not enough dopamine produced anymore in that part of the brain. Okay, what is the result of that? Dopamine is going to moderate our basal, gang, our basal nuclei. In other words, if we don't have dopamine, our basal nuclei can function properly. And the result of that is that we see people with tremor. They might not be able to initiate walking if they can still walk. And many of the typical side effects of Parkinson's disease. So essentially, something goes wrong with the inhibitory mechanism. Remember, we've learned about excitatory and inhibitory postsynaptic potentials, right? And remember how I said inhibition is really needed to make sure that neurons don't become overly excited. We always need to have some inhibition occurring. The reason why people with Parkinson's disease have tremors is because something is not inhibiting um, certain actions, certain firing, firing of certain neurons to where those skeletal muscles are overly contracting. So here you see a nice example of if something isn't working or produced right in the brain, you don't have enough inhibition, and it really majorly messes up the body. So the source of Parkinson's disease is right here in that substantia nigra. I explain that here on this slide, and I give you some examples of famous people that suffer or suffered from Parkinson's, Michael J. Fox, Muhammad Ali, Katherine Hepburn, I'm sure you know that. Okay, a few words about the pons, and again, you guys, you will be responsible up until the end of the cerebellum. There's just a few more slides, so I think you can handle this. 
So pons literally means bridge, meaning a connection between the spinal cord and the rest of the, the, the brain. And remember that the pons, medulla oblongata, and cerebellum, they all are going to originate from the embryological hindbrain or the, the rhombencephalon. So it's this bulging part right here. And there's even a little bit of material that um, is, sits slightly anterior to that cerebellum there. So the question earlier was, what do these connections between the cerebellum and the brainstem look like? In other words, what do those cerebellar peduncles look like? And so here you see a nice view of the peduncles, by the way. So the middle peduncles interconnect the cerebellum with the pons. The superior peduncles interconnect the cerebellum with the midbrain, and then we also have inferior cerebellar peduncles interconnecting the cerebellum with the medulla oblongata. Notice that the pons plays a very important role, as you'll learn about in AMP2. Um, with regulating your breathing, and so does your medulla oblongata. So if you have damage to the pons and or the medulla oblongata, you cannot regulate your breathing rhythm anymore. So that's where we have specialized neurons that tell you, hey, you need to breathe in now, and now you need to breathe out. Breathe in, breathe out. You know how we have that very regular rhythm? It's very carefully controlled at the level of both the pons and the um, medulla. Now notice that I've listed all kinds of cranial nerves here. I am not testing you on the names of these cranial nerves for this upcoming exam, but I will for the final exam. So keep that in mind because they're part of your peripheral nervous system. By the way, the anterior side of the pons, which would be approximately here, that is mostly white matter, and you'll see this better on some of the other images. Um, on the other hand, the posterior side, which would be more here, not this cavity here, which is filled with cerebrospinal fluid, but um, again, not the best picture here. That is mostly gray matter, really a continuum of that tegmentum we talked about in the midbrain. Finally, you're, in addition to um, controlling your respiratory rhythm, notice that your pons has many additional functions that allow you to survive, including even the generation of dreams. Kind of interesting. So in addition to regulating our breathing rhythm, the pons has many additional functions. First of all, it's an important relay area of the brain between the forebrain and the cerebellum. Remember, the forebrain includes both your, your uh, cerebrum as well as your diencephalon. So those are big parts of the brain that form your so-called forebrain. One of the primary brain vesicles we learned about, about is called the forebrain. The second one is the midbrain, and the, the third one is the hindbrain. Other functions of the pons, in addition to respiration, include the swallowing reflex as, as well as control over your bladder, meaning it's at the level of the pons that um, there is regulation with regards to when we urinate. And various other things related to the special census notice, um, including even the movement of our eyes and facial expression, and even posture. Interestingly enough, our pawn seems to have a role in the generation of dreams and that awful feeling that some of us sometimes feel when we sleep where we can't seem to move while we're asleep called sleep paralysis. Again, lots of information here. Not, we don't have much time to go into more details and at times I include information just because it's kind of interesting. Um, not so much to where it's crucial for you to know, such as dream generation and sleep. Blah. This brings us then to the most inferior portion of the brainstem called the medulla oblongata, or you'll often hear anatomists just call it the medulla.
Along with the pons and the cerebellum, it arises from the embryological hindbrain or the rhombencephalon. It is also continuous with the spinal cord and therefore it has a very similar arrangement of the gray matter and the white matter as the spinal cord. We'll see that when we study the spinal cord and I'm just going to make a quick sketch here. It'll, be, um, it'll consist of an outer layer of white matter and then the inside gray matter is sort of the shape of a more or less a butterfly, very sketchy here, with the central canal filled with cerebrospinal fluid. So G for gray matter, W for white matter. So notice that we just have two layers, the gray matter and the white matter. And it's the same way in the medulla oblongata. If we look at, for instance, the, the cerebrum or the cerebellum, they have three layers. We haven't looked at the cerebellum yet, but we have studied the cerebrum, and the cerebrum has an inner core of, you know, quite a bit of gray matter that is then, um, or that is a bunch of nuclei, that is, which are embedded in white matter. So W for white matter. These are all kinds of patches of gray matter. And then surrounding that, we have yet another thin layer, which we call the cerebral cortex of gray matter. So here we have, on top of the white matter, a layer of gray matter. So we don't have that in the case of the spinal cord or in the case of the medulla oblongata. As mentioned before, we'll deal with discussing ventricles later on, and then you'll see how the parts of the brain stem and the cerebellum and the diencephalon and the cerebral hemispheres are positioned in relation to all four ventricles that hold the cerebrospinal fluid in the brain. Now, remember how we learned about the tegmentum in the midbrain, which sits somewhat posterior. It continues down in the pons like so, and it even continues down into the medulla oblongata. This is where a lot of the processing of the input and output of the cranial nerves occurs. Remember, you're, you have 12 pairs of cranial nerves and 10 pairs of these cranial nerves arise from the brain stem. So a lot of the synapses of the fibers in those cranial nerves um, are going to be occurring at the level of the gray matter in the brain stem called the tegmentum. I've mentioned one particular functional brain system several times called the limbic system, and we'll soon learn about a second functional brain system called the reticular formation system. Actually, most of the brain stem forms part of the reticular formation system, um, so we'll study that later. And an important new pair of nuclei for you to keep in mind that is part of the medulla oblongata is the inferior olive nuclei, pretty characteristic for the medulla. In the past, I already taught you about some very important descending nerve tracts called, or just tracts, I should say that would be redundant to say nerve tracts, uh, called the pyramids. And they cross over at the level of the medulla oblongata. Remember, crossing over is called decussation. And then earlier, I also pointed out that the medulla, which, I'm sorry, the cerebellum, I meant to say, that would be sitting right about here. So this would be where you would expect the cerebellum to sit. It has um, these connections to each part of the brain stem. And so the inferior cerebellar peduncles that you see listed here, the inferior cerebellar peduncles interconnect with the medulla oblongata. The middle cerebellar peduncles interconnect with the pons and the superior cerebellar peduncles interconnect um, with the uh, midbrain of the brain stem. So here we're looking at a slide we've studied before when we learned about the different kinds of fibers, fibers that run uh, up and down, typically in between the brain and the spinal cord we refer to as projection fibers. And we see primarily the pyramids illustrated here that cross over or decussate at the level of the medulla oblongata. <laughs> 
Notice here then we see the spinal cord with the butterfly shaped gray matter and the surrounding white matter. On the left picture we see these pyramids illustrated here at the level of the medulla oblongata. This is the bulging pons right here. And deep within the medulla oblongata we see a pair of nuclei, the inferior olive nuclei. The medulla has some functions that overlap with those of the pons and those are functions that relate to our breathing. So we once again see respiratory centers, meaning nuclei related to our breathing rhythm, uh, located in the medulla oblongata. So respiratory centers in the pons as well as in the medulla oblongata. This is really important for you to remember for AMP2. In addition to these respiratory centers, in AMP2 you will learn for weeks on end about the importance of the cardiovascular centers located in the medulla oblongata. As the name says, the cardiovascular centers are centers that control our heart as well as our blood vessels. And so they play a very important role in regulating not just our heart rate, but also our blood, blood pressure. The medulla is a very important part of our brainstem. We really can't live without the brainstem. We definitely cannot live without the medulla because it controls these very important parts, viscera, in our body. In addition to the cardiovascular and respiratory centers, we see some, of, some other interesting centers such as vomiting, hip, hiccuping, swallowing, coughing, and sneezing centers. So this wraps up our discussion of the brainstem. Remember your brainstem has three parts to it, just like all the, big, the other three major parts of the, the brain. The brainstem consists of the most superior midbrain. Then, it's, then there's the bulging pons, as I like to call it, and finally the medulla. Some characteristics of the midbrain are the cerebral peduncles, not to be confused with cerebellar peduncles. They sit on the anterior side. That's where the pyramids run through. On the posterior side, we see those four little nipples we call the corpora quadrigemini. When we make it to the pons, we learned that the pons um, is very important when it comes to regulating our breathing rhythm. So we have respiratory centers located in the pons in addition to some other centers. Um, and finally, we get to the medulla oblongata, which also has respiratory centers, but also very important cardiovascular centers. One more thing to mention about the midbrain, remember that within the midbrain we have an important nucleus called the substantia nigra, which is where we see neurons dying in people who suffer from Parkinson's disease, and consequently not enough dopamine is produced, such that we see things such as tremor and other symptoms, typical symptoms of Parkinson's disease occurring. Finally, we get to the cerebellum, and the word cerebellum literally means little cerebrum. And you'll see that its anatomy is very similar to a little cerebrum. We have an outer layer called the cerebellar cortex, which is made up of gray matter, so I'll put G for gray matter. And it's also very convoluted, you see it on this picture pretty nicely right here. This is all gray matter, very convoluted. Then we have the white matter, and the white matter has a very characteristic look in the cerebellum. Take a look at this, and this should look to you almost like a tree, right? So we have the tree trunk with all of its branches. And so in Latin, that's exactly what we call it. Arbor vitae literally means tree, arbor, and then vitae refers to life. So it literally means the tree of life. Now what is not illustrated here, but what you need to assume is that dispersed throughout this white matter, we're going to have, well actually it is somewhat indicated here, various nuclei, very much the same way as we saw in the cerebrum. So cerebellum literally referring to little cerebrum because of its similar anatomical and um, arrangement.
Don't forget, we learned this already that the cerebellum is interconnected with the three parts of the brain stem. So we have the superior, middle, and inferior peduncles. The cerebellum is similar again to the cerebrum. I should have mentioned that right away in that it has two hemispheres. So be careful on exams and, and reading your book that we'll sometimes use the adjective cerebral versus cerebellar. So notice that the word cerebral is referring to the cerebrum while cerebellar refers to the cerebellum. So we might be talking about cerebellar hemispheres, which are referring to the two halves of your um, cerebellum. These two halves of the cerebellum are interconnected by a worm-like structure, and so we call it the vermis. Think of the word vermin, um, vermis referring to worm-like. Your cerebellum is the second biggest part of the brain, by the way. It makes up about 10% of your brain mass, but it really contains a lot of neurons. So the cerebellum plays a very important role in the brain and it's, it's, it really, there's really still a whole lot of things that we are discovering about the cerebellum on a regular basis. There's, not, there's still a lot of things we don't really know about the cerebellum. Now what do we mean by ipsilateral fibers? Well, we looked at examples of fibers, projection fibers, such as the pyramids, and remember they crossed over. So those are examples of contralateral fibers. They go to opposite sides, contralateral. Some of the fibers that arise from the, the cerebellum, on the other hand, are ipsilateral. And what that means is that they stay on the same side of the body. So these fibers do not cross over. Or what we also see happening is that sometimes fibers cross over and cross over again. And so when they do this double crossing over, clearly they're still going to control the same side of the body as where they originated from the brain. So if the fiber or the cerebellum, so if the fibers originate from the left hemisphere of the cerebellum, they're going to control the left side of the body. Most fibers from the in the brain whether they're going into the brain or coming out of the brain are contralateral however so let's take a look at the some of the functions of the cerebellum by no means am i discussing all of them um, there's still new functions being discovered as we're speaking so the cerebellum first of all its functions overlap a lot with those of the basal nuclei. So I'm going to remind you of that. And your basal nuclei played an important role. Oops, basal nuclei can't talk and write at the same time. Your basal nuclei played an important role in regulating motor control of your skeletal muscles. And we see the same thing for the cerebellum. So your cerebellum plays a role in muscle tone and maintaining your balance and maintaining your body posture. Your cerebellum also plays a very important role in learning how to use all of these muscles, which we'll refer to as motor learning. And finally, along with the basal nuclei, the cerebellum receives a lot of information from other parts of the brain, including uh, the cortex. And with that information, the cerebellum can then make adjustments in the information that is about to leave the brain to tell our muscles what to do. So by that I mean the following. Let's say that I were to drop my pen on the floor and you know I'm a pretty healthy person. I bent over and I have no problem grabbing my pen, right? But if you think about that, just how many muscles plus eye coordination plus so much more um, is involved in that simple act of picking up my pen off the floor. Well, that's where the cerebellum comes in. So the cerebellum receives all this information that is entering the brain as I'm looking at where my pen is, as, as my cerebral cortex start to receive lots of information about muscles, 
about how tense they are versus not tense, about how relaxed they are versus not relaxed, and sends that information to the cerebellum. The cerebellum then makes all kinds of adjustments before commands, that is action potentials, are sent to my skeletal muscles that need to contract in a very coordinated way to where I can nicely, smoothly, efficiently, and effectively pick up my pen, right? I need to have the right muscles contract in my trunk and the right muscles contract in my legs and even in my arms, even in my eyes, and all at the right time and not counteracting one another. So this is what we see um, is part of the function of the cerebellum. And again, your basal nuclei very much help out with that. So I have kind of tried to explain that to you in this particular bullet. So your cerebellar cortex calculates the best way to perform a movement. Make sure that a movement is carried out smoothly and very effectively. And it can send out messages that correct what we're about to do. So just like your basal nuclei, the cerebellum cannot initiate movement. Only your cerebral cortex can do that. But it can make things better, smoother, better coordinated. And it can really ensure that the timing of contracting certain muscles is good. Finally, we also are learning that the cerebellum has some cognitive functions that are related to language in particular, but still not very well understood. So the best way for you to remember the important functions, major functions of the cerebellum is to think of a person who's drunk. We know for a fact when there's injury to the cerebellum, that person looks like that, that like he or she is inebriated or drunk. And a person that's drunk, as you know, can't walk a straight line, stumbles all over the place, has a very difficult time gauging how big a step to take to go up or down stairs. Um, can't, you know, the eyes are all over the place. Their speech is all messed up. Um, there's, no, there's not much meticulous movement anymore. There's no good fine-tuning anymore. So when you are given questions related about the cerebellum on an exam, just try to imagine all the dilemmas, all the struggles that a um, drunk person must go through. As a matter of fact, alcohol impacts the cerebellum. We also see that very often uh, boxers express something called punch drunk, which happens when they have been punched in the head many too many times and their head keeps snapping back. Um, and that is going to uh, damage or injure that cerebellum. So you guys, this wraps up the, the first part of the brain that covers all the material that you need to know for exam three. You may have noticed that the last few slides I didn't record live in class because we ran out of time. But I'm hoping that this mostly live lecture, um, this video and the other videos will help you prepare for the exam.